When it comes to single board computers, I think we can all agree that the Raspberry Pi Zero offers the most attractive price performance size ratio. So it's no wonder that it gets used in dozens of different projects. My favorite one though is a handheld gaming console, because who doesn't love retro gaming? And in this two part video series, I will present you my take on the popular project, so that you can easily create it as well. Let's get started. For starters, we need a 8GB microSD card, which I firstly formatted to its standard settings. Then I downloaded the Recalbox operating system from their GitHub page, unzipped it at the root directory of the SD card and finally plugged the SD card in the Pi. Now it is time for power, but such a 5V charger is not portable and the micro USB cable is bulky. So we might as well use the breakout pins PP1 for 5V and PP6 for ground. For portable power, I went with 4 classical Analoop Nickel Metal Hydride AA batteries that will later be placed inside the integrated battery compartment of my handheld. When fully charged, those have a voltage of roughly 1.4V and will be almost completely discharged at a voltage of 1.2V. And since all of them will be placed in series, we are basically working with voltages between 5.7V and 4.8V, which does partly exceed the USB standard voltage. So I connected the Raspberry Pi to my Lapinch power supply to check whether it would work correctly with the given voltage range. Which it did, because the utilized DC-DC converter, the PAM2306, works with a maximum voltage of 6.5V. But how can we prevent the batteries from over discharge, you may ask? For that, I added a MAX667 voltage regulator IC after the main power switch, which has a very low dropout voltage and thus can generate a voltage of 4.5V by adjusting its set potentiometer. This voltage then powers a MCP602 rail to rail op amp and also directly connects to one non inverting input as a reference voltage. By adding a potentiometer to the inverting inputs, I scaled the 4.8V minimum battery voltage to a value of 3.8V. Which means once the battery voltage falls under 4.8V, the output of the op amp turns on, since this is basically a comparator configuration. The activated output then connects to the set pin of a set reset flip flop clone, which was created with another op amp, and thus turns on its output as well and holds it high even when the battery voltage increases again. This flip-flop output now finally activates a NPN transistor and thereby pulls the gate of a irlz 44 n MOSFET to ground, which now increases its drain to source resistance and thus turns off the Raspberry Pi. And only after disconnecting the battery through the power switch, another power-up is possible. Since this over discharge protection circuit worked pretty well, I created a schematic of it and used a piece of perf board as big as the Raspberry Pi itself to create the circuit more permanently. And most importantly as small and flat as possible. And now that we have power, we need a display. For that I got myself a 3.5 inch rear view monitor, which sadly only works with voltages above 6 volts, which means our battery voltage is too low. But luckily, after I slowly and carefully removed the case of the LCD, I realized that the circuit uses a XL1509IC to step down the input voltage to 5V. So I removed this IC and soldered the input wire directly to the output pin 2. And best of all, it did work, even with voltages from 4.8V to 5.7V. But for the first power-up of the system, a HDMI compatible screen is still mandatory. After the installation was complete, I switched the system to Raspberry Pi B, because I could plug in my keyboard and Wi-Fi dongle simultaneously without having a USB hub laying around. I used the keyboard to enter the network settings and typed in the access information for my network. After establishing a connection, I started the software WinSCP and logged into the Pi as a root user with the password root. 
Then I open the command prompt and enter this command, which enables me to edit the configuration file in the boot directory of the system. There I added a hash symbol to all lines that include the word HDMI and activated overscan as well as the SDTV output before saving the changes. In addition to that, we also need to edit the recalbox configuration file by simply changing the global.video mode to default. Now with those changes, the Raspberry Pi Zero can output its video signal through a composite video cable and thus we can use the small RevView LCD. Next is the audio, which the old Raspberry Pi B offered through a 3.5mm jack, but the Zero type does not have such a jack. Instead, we need to change the GPIO audio output pins in the configuration file, connect pin 13 to a RC filter circuit, followed by a potentiometer wheel, and then finally to the PAM8403 audio amplifier. Since the IC works with voltages from 2.5 to an absolute maximum of 6 volts, we can simply connect it to the battery voltage. It's plus output to a slide switch, which connects to a speaker and a 3.5mm jack for headphones, and finally the negative output to the other side of the speaker and jack. After powering up the system, the audio quality was acceptable, so I sold the passive components to a perf board and tested it out again. But as you might already have noticed, the sound is only mono, not stereo. The reason for that is that we need the other audio GPIO for the controls, which we firstly need to activate in the recall box configuration file, but only for player 1. After rebooting the system, the controller acts according to this given representation of the GPIOs. So it is basically an act of connecting the individual inputs to ground to achieve the described action. Later on though, I will be using a perf board with copper strips on which the conductive material of the buttons will press in order to connect the input to ground and thus activate the action. And just like that the general structure of the Raspberry Pi handheld was complete and already works like a charm. But for your convenience I created a more easier to follow overall schematic of the system as well. Stay tuned for part 2 in which I will house all the components inside the case and bring this project to an end. Until then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. That would be awesome. Stay creative. And I will see you next time.